Compared with binoculars, telescopes are expensive. They must be solidly mounted on the likes of a rigid tripod. There are two sorts of telescope. This is a refractor. Light is collected by a lens and focused in the eyepiece. The minimum useful aperture is 75 millimeters. Telescopes with apertures greater than 100 millimeters are usually reflectors. Popular sizes are 150 and 220 millimeters. Light is collected by a primary mirror on the right, bounced to a secondary mirror, and diverted to an eyepiece at the side. The detail and color we see in an astronomical object depend on how we gather its light. The bigger the lens or mirror, the more light is concentrated on the retina. But the naked eye is poor at seeing color at night. Unaided, this is how we see the Orion Nebula, lower frame. It's still black and white through binoculars or a small telescope. A moderate telescope gives more detail, but only through the biggest instrument does Orion's glory emerge, and that coaxed by supersensitive imaging. Many of the images in this graphic guide come from powerful professional telescopes, like this one in the Andes, or from here in Australia, where astronomer David Malin combines long exposure photography with special processing techniques. He reveals the true colors of stars. In this case, the true colors and detail of his Orion Nebula. Huge instruments, like the very large telescope in Chile, gather light as few stargazers can. Synchronized and combined with three others, this mirror equals a 16-meter eye. By comparison, orbiting 600 kilometers above, the Hubble Space Telescope has a modest mirror. But out here, it's untroubled by Earth's atmosphere. Hubble's brilliant pictures feature throughout this graphic guide. From our vantage point on Earth, and from above it, we've learned how to view the cosmos. But how do we measure its distance? Starting locally, our tiny planet is a mere speck against the Sun. The Sun has more than a hundred times the diameter of the Earth. This local star of ours could swallow us a million times over and still have room to spare. And here's another measure. Light from the sun takes under eight and a half minutes to reach Earth. And there's the clue. Using the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers a second, astronomers measure distance. To the nearest star system, Alpha Centauri, it's 4.3 light years. In other words, it takes more than four years for the light from Alpha Centauri to reach us. In terms of the Milky Way, from the Sun to our galactic center is 30,000 light years. Finally, a preview of some objects we'll meet in the seasonal sky guides that follow. The spiral arms of this galaxy abound in nebulae. We're interested in the pinkish ones, clouds of glowing hydrogen gas. Like the Lagoon Nebula in the Milky Way, such clouds are starbirth regions, known as gaseous emission nebulae. Another example is the Rosette Nebula. Emission means that the nebula emits its own light. The Rosette surrounds a group of stars called an open cluster. An open cluster may be a few dozen stars, or hundreds scattered across 50 light years. The most famous open cluster is the Pleiades, or Pleiades. These are reflection nebulae, clouds of gas and dust reflecting colored starlight. Two more, beautifully reflecting light from embedded stars. Now to dark nebulae, not holes in space, but dense clouds of dust. On the left, the Cone Nebula, a classic dark nebula in brilliant surroundings. And here, 
the most famous dark nebula, the Horsehead. Next, planetary nebulae. This is the Helix Nebula, formed as a dying star expels shells of gas. Another, more complex, is the Cat's Eye Nebula. And even more complex, the Hourglass Nebula. A planetary nebula is a form of emission nebula. So too is a supernova remnant. Here, the Crab Nebula. Supernova remnants are the entrails of giant stars that have exploded. As with all emission nebulae, supernova remnants generate their own light. Like tiny outriders around the great disk of our galaxy, float some 150 globular clusters. They're bunches of ancient stars, some tightly packed with dense cores. Others looser. They may contain tens, even hundreds of thousands of stars. There could be a million in one of the largest globular clusters, 47 Tucani. Lastly, to galaxies. The blue patches in this time-lapse are the Magellanic Clouds, two satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. With no distinctive shape, they're called irregular galaxies. By contrast, Andromeda is a well-defined spiral galaxy and largest member of our local group. Beyond that group, an elliptical galaxy with a dusty band known as NGC 5128 Still farther, this one is an edge-on spiral. Its reference, NGC 4945. And another, NGC 4565. NGC means New General Catalogue. Even deeper into space, the Sombrero Galaxy is also an edge-on spiral. Here's an elliptical galaxy, M87. M is for Messier the catalogue of a French astronomer. This is a face-on spiral, NGC 2997, 55 million light-years from home. And this, a barred spiral, NGC 1365, at 60 million light-years. The central bar also features in NGC 1300, at 75 million light-years. Most galaxies occur in groups, some with just two or three members. Others are vast, like the Virgo cluster, bustling with some 3,000 galaxies. A little more distant is the Fornax cluster, less rich in galaxies, but sporting some gems. Still farther, the Coma cluster, with more than a 1,000 galaxies. And here, the distant Perseus cluster, a rich but faint array. These are the most remote galaxies ever glimpsed, four billion times fainter than stars we see by naked eye. Images from the Hubble Space Telescope. No matter, we'll never glimpse them, for the cosmos is an endless journey of fascination, however we view it. <laughs>